Well, it is uh, 18 hours and 25 minutes into the day of Saturday, November 30th, 2013. And that is our date and time stamp for this Insta vlog. It does take a while, but sometimes between Insta vlogs, depending on how many, how much actually is how much information is coming in. When inf information comes in on a particular research topic, you have to go and verify. You have to, to sort of research the, the information that comes in itself to make sure that you have that you understand what you have, and that that you have something to sort of you know present. Insta vlogs in many cases are the notes. The, it's not the finished research product. These are the raw lab notes. So what you're seeing here is raw, it's rough, it's unedited. And we have three vlogs that are going to be in this uh, Insta vlogs. It's going to be the AP Space vlog, the OC Med vlog, and the Cybernetics vlog. Those are the three vlogs that are going to be in this vlog, this Insta vlog today. Those are the three areas that I'm going to be sort of presenting the notes. And because this is what I've been doing during the week, actually. This sort of represents these last two weeks since the last vlog. Uh, this represents the stuff I've sort of been working on. There's more stuff, but... <clears throat> they're not ready yet to be put into Insta, Insta vlogs. They're still really in the really unfinished sort of ethereal state where nothing is really formed together and there's not really much to come up, what, come up and say here. Uh... So the first one we'll start off with is uh, the AP Space Vlogs. Uh, AP, space, AP Space Vlogs, as I said before, uh, AP stands for uh, Astronomy and Physics, and Space is, well, for Space. And so and it's, it's the law, the vlog, that covers these particular topics, this particular research. And uh, we've got a TV channel associated with it. Uh, unfortunately, I've forgotten written it down, and I've kind of forgotten to... Uh, um, to uh, write out, I think it's AP Space TV, just like the vlog itself. I said, take out the vlog and put it in TV, and there you go. Uh, it's also on YouTube, and uh, some of the stuff that, that uh, I'm researching on there is actually going to be there rather than being on the Cyborg Alpha TV. So I'll put a link to it below, and you can go over and check out and see some of the uh, raw videos, the raw resources that I've. Uh, sort of flag that's interesting. Uh, the one I'm talking about today, today, the topic today, is ghost hunting. Uh, for those of you who are into paranormal and par uh, uh, parapsychology uh, type of uh, uh, <laughs> uh, things, uh, this is sort of ghost hunting, ghost spirits, and all this type of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> now, normally because it's called parapsychology, and it's sort of viewed as an extension of psychology. One would think that it's uh, that we're looking at, we should be looking at this in the cybernetics vlog. Well, to a degree, yes, because this actually isn't, uh, as I said before, uh, parapsychology is kind of a misstatement because psychology is the uh, is the uh, science of the soul, is the research of the soul. Uh, that's actually what it means, psych, the, 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 the first part, the sihi, sihi is psych in Greek, and it's actually pronounced sihi, uh, that means soul, so the si, sihi orologia, right, sihi orologia, logia is a logi, sihi is a psych, and that means study of the soul. So, as I said, because... The psychology of Freud, and this is all modern psychology is based on this, is without the soul, 
is based on man being an animal and without soul, without, without God, then you don't really have a real psychology. You have something else in its place, but uh, it still remains, uh, but sort of a contradictory type of thing. And I stated that it replaces, it's going to need to be replaced by something known as quantum mechanics. This quantum mechanics states, and this is a result of the Heisenberg and Sinti principle, that you cannot make the statement absolutely that God doesn't exist. You can only state it probability in, in a probabilistic term. In other words, with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the law of absolutes, the that what we call modern science, or what most people view as modern science, which isn't really modern science, uh, rests on is gone now. There is no absolute science. There is no absolute scientific truth anymore because all you can get with the Heisenberg and Sydney principle is a probability. You cannot get to the absolute. Uh, absolute knowledge, absolute uh, truth is asymptotic. And for those of you who understand the fundamentals of calculus, you'll understand that the absolute of truth can only be reached in the limit. Excuse <coughs> <Jeez>. me. <coughs> And so what happens is, is that this creates a need for a new study, a new approach to psychology. And I said because psychology is no longer, uh, because quantum mechanics is no longer the edge of science, is the edge of known science now. In other words, that there, before it was the edge of science and there was a solid line and you could say, oh, this is where science ends. Well, you can't say that anymore. It's now a dotted line. There is beyond. There is beyond quantum mechanics. There is become quant, beyond quantum fat, quantum physics. And the question is, what is the next point beyond that we need to go to? Or we should go to. And I stated that the next point that we should go to uh, in the beyond that presented enough evidence was quantum psychology. In other words, a study of the soul based on the principles of quantum mechanics, based on the principles of observational science within astronomy and physics. And because these observational sciences have done so well and have been able to push the boundaries, you should have be able to find enough evidence to suggest that, okay, we can then take the same modeling, the same model uh, of, of scientific method, the same scientific method, bring it forward and bring it into psychology, creating a quantum psychology, and this pr produces a new boundary uh, that we can aim for. <coughs> And this produces our look at cybernetics because we are, are in cybernetics. Cybernetics is the creation of the human being, brain, uh, a, a model of the human brain, a mechanical model of the human brain, that we can put quantum psychology under here. So why are we doing ghost hunting under AP science, well, un, under astronomy and physics? Well, the problem is, is that what ghost hunting talks about is talks about this whole issue here, and this is what I've talked about before, that there are enough physical evidence, and this is why I introduced uh, quantum psychology as an extension of quantum physics, uh, because there is enough physical evidence now that we have the ability to go and test these ideas. i give an example. Spiritual universe. Is there a spiritual universe out there? Well, in quantum mechanics, if you study quantum mechanics, you go into superstring theory, you look at the latest theories on physics, what are we talking about? We're talking about hidden, unseen, parallel universe. Well, isn't the spiritual universe, can't the spiritual universe be classified as a parallel universe? Well, if they can, then you have an analog in physics for this. Do we have things that are invisible in space? Well, yes, we do. We have black holes and dark energy and dark matter. Uh, things that we can't see, that all we can see are, is the evidence of its of its impact on the surrounding environment. In other words, when you go look for a black hole, you can never actually see a black hole by its definition. What you can see is the impact it has on the space around it. And then once you see that impact on the space around it, you can say, ah, there must be, or probably there is, a <coughs> black hole causing this particular thing. You never see the black hole. You can never confirm the black hole is there. All you can state is that there is probably a black hole there. In other words, there's never been a black hole found. What you have are candidates. You have approximates, that things that, that match the description of what would happen to the surrounding environment if a black hole was present. 
And because this exists, and it actually exists in mathematics, dealing with complex planes. And that's where you have a real uh, uh, number plus an imaginary number that gives you your complex plane. Complex plane is your real universe uh, added to the real plane added to the imaginary plane. Uh, again, this is where your mathematics has to be pretty good about this in, in, in here uh, to understand complex planes. That there is a mathematical understanding to this. Then you can also go into this and argue because there is unseen and you can only approach things that you're dealing with uh, things that are in the limit. That's a fundamental count. That's, that's limits, derivatives, uh, integrals. Uh, that's your fundamental calculus. Because you've got an entire mathematics there, you can now go out and start beginning to build the blocks around that. So where does this take us now? Well, as, this looks, as I began looking into uh, ghost research and the sort of this ghost hunting stuff, I began looking to see what was out there in terms of the channels and what was offering. Most of the TV, st the stuff you see on TV is, uh, let's call it to be polite, entertaining. In other words, there's no real hard hard science there. They play a lot of background music. There's a lot of blah, you know, and ooh, and you know, enough. There's there's basically uh, stuff there to be fun at Halloween, but in terms of science and actual research, there really isn't much there. Uh, and so, what we have to do is we have to go in, build the meat. We have to fill that void. Uh, so. Where do you go to see if there's any stuff out there? Well, YouTube, ironically enough, has enough people on it that they're putting everything out there. So more often than not, you can go onto YouTube and do a pretty good survey, a general survey, to see what's out there <coughs> and see if there is there is there a community already looking into this. And if, they are, if there is, what have they found? Have they put their evidence up on, on YouTube? And I think it's, I did find that. I actually found people putting up evidence of, of what they call ghosts. Uh, these are known as uh, EVPs, ghost boxes. Uh, they talk about evidence about seeing ghosts. Uh, and another another whole variety of uh, what I call physical phenomena uh, that are linked to ghosts. Well, what they, link are, are, they say are linked to ghosts. So let's call them physical phenomena because we're going to leave them as undefined for now, uh, like, like that. And then we're going to go try and define them. And the first ones are the ghost boxes in the, EV, in the EVPs. As I began looking up and researching the EVPs and seeing how to record them, and I did some own test recording, I began realizing what they were doing with EVPs is listening for patterns, random patterns that actually appear uh, within white noise. White noise is... Uh, the static of a radio station, the static in between radio stations, uh, fan, if you have a fan on, particularly if you have a metal fan on, there's white noise coming out of that. And there are bizarre, I know from myself, there are bizarre, bizarre even without recording, there are bizarre audio uh, experiences, acoustical experiences, with white noise that... Uh, it could lead you to think that there may be a ghost, that there may be something more there that needs investigating. And so, at a minimum, it's something more that needs investigating from the physical side, from the physical side of things. Uh, from the ghost point of view, it could be well, that could be a ghost talking to you. Uh, I know with a fan on, I've I've woken up when I have my heating fan on, and I thought, hey, somebody turned the TV on. There's a radio station on. I get up, look for the radio where 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 the uh, see where the radio uh, is that's on, and there's no radio on. I go into the room, it, it just simply disappears. I go back to bed, wake up again. There's the same radio noise again. And what I realized as I was going through this sort of investigation of what where this noise was coming from, I realized that it was the heating fan that I had, which is all my, my heating system is all metal, and it was the heating fan creating turbulence in the air. That turbulence in the air began to sound like a radio station, like someone was talking, and you had this music going on. And, and the thing is, is that you could, I could never understand whether or not whether or not it was actually a clear signal or not. And so, if let's say you get something like this and you actually record it, and I am going to try to do this. I'm going to try to record these phenomena. I don't know how successful they're going to be, but I'm going to try to record these phenomena and see if I can get some samples about this. The question is. Is what I'm hearing something that's going on within my mind? 
Or is there actually something physical going on? In other words, is there a physical signal? Is there an audible, real signal there coming in from, uh, uh, from a radio station, from uh, maybe sound that's uh, been bouncing around for a while? Maybe that's what's going on. Sound really has some really bizarre uh, properties. And I've experienced that myself, that the sound does have very bizarre properties. Uh, things that have not been explained properly in the science textbooks and that need further investigation. And you may find ghosts in there. And that might, where, may be where you're seeing the white noise, the, the EVPs. This is, may be attributed to this phenomenon, particularly audio phenomena, going on in <coughs> fans. The other place to look at things is these ghost boxes, which are basically looking at white noise. Again, it's a white noise phenomenon within radio signals. And because you're dealing with radio signals here, you're looking at uh, you're looking at particularly EMF, electro electromagnetic fields. And when you're talking about electro electromagnetic fields and you're talking about radio, you're talking about Tesla. In other words, this is a chance where we can go with ghost boxes to go in and see if Tesla had ever actually found something with these ghost boxes, uh, if there was something that there was more important to them on this thing here, and whether or not there, this is maybe reason why, if, if Tesla had found something on ghost boxes, if there was something more concrete on this, maybe that's why a large chunk of Tesla's work is missing. You know, because this is it. The big thing about Tesla, every time you talk about Tesla, it was anyone, anyone who knows about Tesla, anyone who's in the research field, you know, in, in the physics, and it's turned about Tesla. As soon as you're talking about Tesla, the ears pick up. Whoa, Tesla! They're talking about Tesla. What's going on? <laughs> you know, there's an excitement about Tesla. And one of the, te the reasons why uh, there's an excitement about Tesla is he was a scientist who was very much ahead of his time. And a large chunk of his worst work is missing. No one knows where it went. But they do know that a large chunk of his work is missing. And the big thing now is to, for some of the scientists particularly if you want to go out and really explore the universe, you really don't have the restrictions of a standard university grant that's sort of... The university, standard university grants, if you're a standard university scientist, you have a team of people standing over you, approving of what you're going to be doing, or, just, or, or not approving what you're going to be doing in terms of the funding that you get. And that type of environment is a very closed environment, it's a restrictive environment, and it only allows you to go to a certain distance in terms of exploring the edges of the universe. It's a very conservative way of exploring the universe. If you want to go and explore openly and not have these restrictions, then you need to step outside the university grant environment the way I did 20 years ago and sort of build your own environment. And that way you can go wherever you want to go. And so this is where this becomes a little different than everybody else's. Because I'm independently funded, I do not have to go back to a university uh, committee. I do not have to go to any committee to say, I want to do this re research for this particular reason. If I find an interest in a particular area, something perks my interest or piques my interest, I go in that direction. That's th and that's why um, I, stay, I started off with the random walk. The random walk is my research method. There's no purpose to it. It's simply, does something interest you? Does something catch your eye? Go over, see what it is, investigate it, look at it, and see what you can understand from what you observe. In other words, it's completely observational. There is no, you know, poking around with it. And play, really, there is simply the observational work. Your tests, in many ways, that you want to do on it in, in terms of furthering your understanding, you do not want to change it. You don't want to destroy it. You don't want to... Uh, alter it. You want to see the uh, whatever it is you're trying to understand in its natural environment as it is. Uh, and that's sort of the way this research is approached. It's basically in the environment, in the moment, uh, and you're looking at things in a very raw and unrefined manner. And at some point in time, through observation, you try to refine it. You bring it down to a finer point. But this is something that takes time. It's not a short thing. So this is where we leave off here with, uh, with uh, ghost hunting. This is where we're going to go up next. The next is try to try, sort of try out these uh, white, noise, white noise experiments. First I'm going to do the audio, then I'm going to do the uh, uh, EMF tests for white noise on EMF. 
and then we'll go from there. Let's see, you know, where we can explore. But this is actually, this is not going to be next week or whatever. This is going to be weeks down the road. I'll make mention of this as we go through it, but it is going to be some time. Up next, what I will be doing is we'll talk about in the next segment. We're going to talk about going to the uh, OC Med vlog. That's our new vlog that's sort of popping in here. It's not really a new vlog, but just the way we define things. I said I wasn't able to sort of get everything defined in the uh, different vlog list that would be in here. This is one of the things I missed out and uh, going to add it in. And it does fit in with what we're talking about. So I will, uh, in the next segment, talk about the uh, OC Med vlog. <laughs> Welcome back to the next segment. We're talk we're going to be talking about the OC Med Vlog, and the OC Med Vlog stands for the Organic Chemistry uh, Medical Vlog. And my view of uh, medicine, because there's a variety of views of, views of med medical science, is not from the standard point of view. Most doctors, and I am an MD come from the perspective of anatomy. In other words, they study the anatomy, they do the dissection of the anatomy, and that's how you become a doctor. My approach to medical science, and this is where I got my MD from, was from the point of view of organic chemistry. It's organic chemistry within the human body. Now, this field is not uh, fully recognized by the standard medical community. This is something outside of uh, standard medicine. It is cutting edge, it is bleeding edge research. And some people will accept it and some other people won't. It really depends on your uh, scientific perspective, your view on medical science. Do you think medical science should be rigid and within the political controls or political confines of your subjective university where, in other words, uh, things are not medical science unless they're approved by the uh, uh, standing medical bodies of a particular country or a particular state or whatever? Or do you view that medical science is something, is it real science, should be objective and should be in, in many ways just the way as, as, a, as in physics, uh, as in, in quantum physics, something that could be open depending on how the institute that is doing the research and the scientist that is doing the research within that institute, how they actually approach the science. Is the institute restrictive? In other words, is it trying to go for grants in a very particular area? Like a good example, uh, most organic chemistry uh, research is confined to the drug companies and they're looking for drug discovery. So in other words, if you do seek organic chemistry in medicine out there, but it's restricted by most institutes who are doing this type of work to drug discovery because that's where the money is coming from. The money is coming from the uh, drug research grants and when they go to apply for these grants, they're saying, we're going to be doing drug discovery. And that's all they do. They do drug discovery. And that's the limit and the, the extent to which they get into organic chemistry in terms of their research. Uh, but if you're an independent organization, if you're an independent institute, and are not dependent on these funds, and you have a blind fund, I have a blind fund, uh, the way my institute does, my research institute has a blind fund. That means the money is not attached to anything specific. So... I do not have to attach my research to the funds. So my research can be whatever I want it to be. It's wherever my interest takes me. And uh, basically it came as I was doing my research in, in quantum mechanics uh, and quantum physics. I realized there was more beyond the quantum mechanics, quantum physics, uh, as I was doing the research in the, with the random walk. I began to see how physics was related to organic chemistry. As I started doing the work inside organic chemistry from a physics point of view, uh, from a physicist point of view, I began to see how medicine was related to uh, organic chemistry. And that began to sort of pique my interest, and I began moving in that direction and adding and sort of filling those particular areas where, or, or, where, where medicine was a part of organic chemistry. And this is where I got to the point where I was able to treat patients, I was able to sort of identify particular problems within the human body and view them from a organic chemistry standpoint rather than simply as a um, 
clinician or a clinical standpoint. Clinical standpoints do not necessarily, in terms of the science, understand the actual functions of what's going on. They understand there is a dysfunction, particularly with a, with, a, with a cardiac issue or something like that. They understand that there is a dysfunction, but they don't understand why the dysfunction is necessarily there. In other words, the organic chemistry of what's actually going on in a heart attack or a stroke in, or these other particular issues, let's like say, chem, uh, say cancer, they're not properly understood. They're not fully researched out. There are holes in there. There are areas that need to be researched. And unless you're doing the research in organic chemistry and treating the human body as a subset of organic chemistry, in other words, medicine is a derivative, a, a sub-subject within organic chemistry, unless you take that view, then there's going to be sections of your medical understanding as, as, a, as a practitioner uh, that is going to be missing. In other words, and I think it's, this is what needs to be understood, a practitioner is not necessarily a scientist. So what happens is, it, it, someone has an MD, are they a practitioner or are they a scientist? Or are they both? Uh, a practitioner who is, uh, has an MD as just a practitioner is not a scientist. Uh, the scientist has to be the scientist first. And then from the science, from the research, then you become a clinician because you see your research, your science, apply and, and be applicable to the patient. And you invite your patients in. You tell them, look, I am a scientist. I'm a researcher. I am not a clinician. I may have something that might help you. Are you interested? And then you begin a conversation. And you have to explain to the patient fully that what you're doing is experimental. You can't say to the patient, ah, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You know, you're in good hands with me. You have to explain to the patient that the work you're doing is experimental, that you are a researcher, that you're a researcher and that you're a scientist. You have to explain the risks to the person. The areas that you don't know, because as a scientist, as an explorer, the reason, one of the reasons why you are a scientist, the one of the reasons you are an explorer is because of the unknown. You're not there because of what you know. You're never there because of what you don't know. That's what you want to find. You're fine. You want to find what you don't know already. You want to fill in those get those holes, those gaps of understanding. And that's where this whole uh, medical side of organic organic chemistry comes in. And as we talk about this structure of the human body, as we start, talk about the functions, the physiology of the human body, this is where I am going to be bringing in over the next few weeks, uh, because I just finished it, I'm actually still kind of dealing with it, and that's about the, uh, the sleep deprivation wall, uh, sleep issues. Uh, many doctors will spend, and researchers will spend billions of dollars setting up very expensive research labs for sleep research labs. I realized this many years ago, that I was actually doing sleep research without actually knowing that other people had been doing it. I have a book here. Let me see if I can find it. Well, yeah, here it is here. Just give me a minute to find the book. Uh, it's under things. <laughs> there are so many books here. And you see, I've got my new friends here, too. Uh, and you see, I can do a lot of... I do a lot of reading here. This is where I do a lot of my reading. Uh, here we go. There's SpongeBob. Here it is here. This is uh, the book that I got many years ago. As I was doing my re my uh, work into uh, medical research, this is here. It's called Wide Awake at 3 a.m. My choice or by chance, and it is a uh, basically done by a doctor, Richard Richard M. Coleman, uh, Stanford University Medical School, and this was uh, let's see when was this book when I got this book. Sort of giving the published it will tell me. Uh, <laughs> tell me uh, uh, when I was looking at this. Um, let's see here. Oh, this, I got I got this book later. This book was written in uh, 1986. So this was done in 1986. Uh, but uh, I was still in uh, uh, doing my undergrad work at that point in time. I didn't get into sleep research and find this book until about uh, sometime after 2000. Uh, and 
Now, the thing is that this is what we're going into. We're going to go into sleep deprivation. We're going into one of the reasons why people may have insomnia, some of the issues behind insomnia, and then some of the we're going to some of the physiological effects that actually occurred during sleep, de sleep deprivation and people who actually live with sleep deprivation. I actually live with sleep de deprivation because I never really get enough time uh, to recover from a sleep deprivation. There's always something taxing up my body. So week after week, I'm more often than not sleep deprived, sleep deprived in terms of there's a chunk of sleep that I should have had missing from the schedule and I will go into some of the effects. You've seen some of the effects already in my vlogs. I vlog the uh, the sleep deprivation the sleep deprivation crash. It's already in there. If you go back into the videos that I've done previously, you will see I talk about my crashes. I talk about my sleep deprivation crashes. And this is you know when I hit this wall, you'll see it. And you actually see what you see in there is that there's a period of time where I have a lot of good videos coming up. I'm producing videos on a regular basis. All of a sudden, there's a chunk there where there's, uh, days start. I start missing days of videos. What's well, happening? Sleep deprivation is happening, and I'm not able to function properly. I have to readjust my schedules, and there is a uh, even within the, that sleep uh, restful period, I have to sort of have a conflict where, uh, yeah, I need to rest, I need to relax, I need to sort of take that time off, but at the same time, I need to also deal with some of these scheduling issues because things have to go on when you're an independent researcher when you have an independent research institute you have to deal with things on a 24 7 basis 24 7 basis in other words it never ends you never really turn off and you have to really learn how to adjust to that and relax at the same time so that's kind of where we're going with uh uh with the organic chemistry uh, medical vlog this is going to be in more depth in later Insta vlogs. We'll talk about that more. Uh, so now that we understand that organic organic chemistry is in the science of medicine, uh, we can go on to the next vlog, the cyber uh, the cybernetics vlog, and talk about something known as chemical man. And this was something talked about in previous Insta vlogs, in previous vlogs about chemical man. And we'll show you how it interacts with Freud and psychology. All right, we'll see you in the next segment. Well, welcome back uh, to the next, to the last segment of Insta Vlogs. This is going to be the last of, of the segment. We're going to try to do three segments every Insta Vlog, uh, depending on how much uh, information we actually have. And uh, this vlog is we're going to, now we're falling into the uh, cybernetics vlog. As I explained before, uh, we were dealing with quantum psychology. And the reason why quantum psychology actually links in with the previous vlog, with the, with the OC Med vlog, as I said before, because there was a scientific view, and there still is a scientific view, that man is a chemical machine. And chemical man, when you talk about the genetics of happiness, you talk about the genetics of a variety of emotional and mental health issues, this is not something that's new. This is something that was around in the 30s during, during uh, uh, the Nazi era. And a large reason why you had the death camps at Auschwitz and Dachau and all these particular different areas was because they believed that these people who were in these areas, uh, were in these camps, were mentally ill, and that they believed the man was fundamentally a chemical being. And this is what I'm talking about, chemical man. The concept of a chemical man, that our emotions are all chemically oriented, that they're caused by neurology, by the brain, by chemistry in the brain, that someone who is mentally ill is chemically imbalanced, you may, you may have heard this before, uh, that that someone who is, has a bipolar has a, a imbalance in in, his, in 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 the neurochemistry in the chemistry in this brain that is a chemical imbalance. This is not something that's new. This is something that's old. This is something that's been in history more than a hundred years ago, and it's coming back again. This is a rehash of a a old scientific idea, and there are new proofs, unfortunately. People will be excited about it. People will be 
uh, very adamant about their beliefs and their views, but there is no scientific proof. When you go to uh, uh, medical, with so-called medical uh, journals, and you really do have to be careful with the medical journals, and you have to be careful with the science journals, because there is a lot of mistaken idea, ideas in there. There is a lot of mistaken uh, lab reports. A lab reports that, while they'll say in there, and this, I'll get, get this turn, get this, get this sort of, uh, uh, this whole thing here. Uh, They'll use if you look at the at, at their particular uh, if you look at this, their particular uh, research reports, the titles and the abstracts can be very misleading because they'll talk about things like seems to be and appears and suggests, but that's all that's there. What happens is that the certainty of the suggestion, the certainty of the maybe, the certainty of the perhaps is simply an assertion. There's no actual scientific proof there. When you go in, and this is, uh, I've seen this myself, with the uh, gay gene. Uh, I read the original article for the gay gene many years ago. The article said, oh, we have found the gay gene. And as you begin looking at the article, the abstract starts off very positive, slips in the, the, maybe, the maybes and the suggests are very muted, and you seem like from the if you read the abstract that yes they found the gay gene, and if that's all you read and you don't go through the uh, actual lab report and the lab notes and the lab data with with a great deal of scrutiny, then you'll miss this. In order to get the numbers they did, they had to statistically adjust the raw data. In other words, the gay gene does not appear genetically on its own. It's not in the raw data. You don't see a gay gene. The gay gene only appears when the data they have is statistically adjusted. In other words, you have to perform some mathematics on it, and voila, the gay gene appears. And how does this mathematics come about? Well, you, mathematics begins on particular assumptions. Right? You assume things with mathematics. That's how the math here, mathematics begin. If your assumptions are wrong, that you start with, even though your math is right, the end conclusion, even though the math is logical, will also be wrong. So here's the thing. When you start with the gay, the gay gene, and you say, oh, there is a gay gene, what do you need to have a gay gene? You need to be able to find the gay gene in all men and women. Well, that's not what they found. They found the gay gene simply to be within men. Or what they call the gay gene. So they said, okay, let's take out and remove the female portion of the experiment. So they deleted the female portion of the experiment and only calculated on the male portion. And yeah, here you go. Here's your number. There it is, def definitively. There's the gay gene. But if you read further in the article, what else did they delete from their statistics? You know, they, they what call weighted it out, right? Stati they call it statistical weighing of data. And, and in a statistical weighing of data, you put more emphasis on certain things and de-emphasize other things. And so what did they de-emphasize? What did they subtract or remove from the statistics to get this sort of pro what they call properly weighted gay gene? statistics. What they removed is from the one that we've already talked about, they removed the female genes. There are no, the, 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 there was no females in the sample. Two, when they did the, the work, in, in order to get the male portion showing a gay gene, they had to remove what they call anomalies. And what were these anomalies? These were genes, so, so possibly, supposedly gay genes, that appeared in men who were completely straight. So in other words, they had found this gene. They said, "Oh, this is the gay gene." Went out and did a, a went out and did a pool of say, oh, of, of, of another pool of people, looking for this particular gay gene. Right, looking for the gay gene. They went out, took a sample of people. People who were willing to do these medical experiments. They took blood samples. Let's look for the gay gene. Found the gay gene. 
said, okay, all you men here, you're gay. And nope, not all the men were gay. And they these people identified as not being gay. And, and because, you know, there are sort of tells, and, 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 and well, I'm not going to go into the particular details of this, but there are ways uh, medically to know whether a person's gay or not. Uh, in addition to certain, uh, in, in addition to um, someone saying yes or no. Uh, and the thing is, what happens, the respondents, even on the survey, said they weren't all gay, even though the gene says that this, they were all supposed to be gay. And so what happens is they, they simply discounted, the ones that said no, they weren't gay, were discounted. And the thing is, when you start go through, go through the statistics, you go through and actually say, well, what's the probability of the gay gene in the total survey? In other words, in physics, you have to take the probability on the total. Not just the small sample you say is significant. In, in quantum physics, you have to take the entire thing. You have to consider, in quantum physics, all probabilities. And once you consider all probabilities, then and only then can you state that something has a particular probability. But it's in relationship to the total probability. And when you go look at the gain gene in the total probability, go through the article and you calculate out the total probability. The probability of the gay gene is 25%. Now, in other words, what they did is they went from a 25% failure to tell you there's no gay gene, that's the actual raw data, to a 75% probability of a gay gene through statistical analysis. In other words, there, there was no real data showing this. They simply fudged the numbers, statistically, to get the the uh, 75%. And that's what was published in, as the main headlines. And so what's happened is you've had this mythology built on this whole concept, on this one article, of the gay gene. And the thing is now, what happens, and this, is, this was something that was warned about in the journal Science years ago, that funders will start demanding research results in science that they want to see. In other words, if you're going out for cancer drug, if you're going out for a cancer research, and you're going out for a grant, and you're approaching a funder who does cancer cancer research drug uh, funding, you know they're a public charity. They're uh, you know they're they're a charity that says, okay, we are going to take the public's money or whatever that we got from charity, and we're going to spend it on cancer research. Unless your re research reports report back to them favorably in your research, in other words, showing hope, then your research is canceled. And so in other words, unless you re write your research for the funder and for funding, in many ways like an advertisement, then you do not get your funding. In other words, your, your, your job is canceled because you're, if you can't get your funds coming in, you don't have a job as a scientist. And this is what sort of come into a lot of this sort of uh, uh, these sort of called mental health genes, the mental science genes, the neurology of mental health, is a large chunk of it is funded by particular groups who have interests in seeing the return of chemical man. In other words, they want to see man as a chemical being. This is what they want to see. And this is what you better show them in the reports or else your funding is going to get cancelled. And this is what's popping up. And so we're talking about this. Uh, uh, I was talking about uh, this to uh, Katie135. She's a beauty guru. You go by a lot of these beauty guru channels. And what happens here is they talk about happiness. They talk about a lot of these uh, the girls for some reason seem to be into psychology. Uh, and... Uh, a large chunk of them will talk about this uh, this genetic link to happiness. It, it says, it, it says, uh, it says, Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, uh, informative comment. I'm curious as to your opinion as to the role of genetics and happiness. Much of what I've, what I've read uh, seemed to pinpoint the actual percentage uh, for how much genetics has anything to do with happiness. So I suppose, I assume, possibly incorrect, that there is a definitive 
a genetic link to overall happiness. Uh, much like uh, many say, there's a definitive link to uh, genetic depression. And she lists, cite lists two particular uh, research reports, one from the journal Nature and one from a, uh, a Cambridge University uh, medical journal, uh, particularly on mental health. And, and let's see here. And this is what she, one of them says. One of them talks about the gene that seems to be linked to uh, uh, happiness. And, and uh, this is the thing, they're using the term against seems. They're not using the term is or does. It's it's the seems to be like that. And the problem is, is that when you go into the, these research articles, and uh, a large chunk of these research articles are hidden. You can't get access them. They're not publicly available. So all you see are the abstracts and the, uh, and, and the thing. You have to go through a variety of different means to go to see them. But if you actually go back into, if you're a researcher, and I have access to the research articles, the direct research articles, you go in and you start digging. What you see is what I've said before. Uh, there's no definitive in. There, there's no definitive answer on the gay gene. There's no definitive answer on the gene for depression. There's no definitive... Uh, information on the uh, gene for happiness. Uh, most of the tests and experiments that done, the studies have done are highly problematic in terms of the methodology used. There were other methodologies that could have produced other different results. And as I said, in, in, in quantum mechanics, uh, in, in the research method of quantum mechanics, you have to consider all, before you publish, publish your findings, as a final published article. And that's what this isn't. This isn't a final published article. These are research notes. Uh, you have to consider all probabilities. All. And because you don't do that, you don't see this in uh, these research reports, they're only talking about very specific studies. And that's why you see in many cases, uh, public, and, and this is where the public has sort of been gone crazy with, Every so often, a report, uh, so, so, uh, a, a research part report is public. Study says apples are bad for you. Got blah 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 blah. And there's a whole bunch of stuff, and everyone goes crazy and starts shoving apples off the shelves because they think it's bad for you. Then an article, an article will come out. Apples are good for you, right? Six months later, another, another article, will come out, another study will come out and say apples are good for you, and everyone stampedes up and they get with the next thing that's good for them. You know, they go and fill the shelves with apples. Or they'll say they'll talk about uh, ginkgo biloba. They, they talk. There, there was a report on that. There was a there was a study that made uh, aloe vera as the me medical cure for in, 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 for aging and everything else under the sun. Then there was tea. Then there was uh, then when, then there was something good for coffee. Then there was something bad for coffee. There was something good for wine. There was something bad for wine. And what happens? You have people running around from medical research to medical research. To medical report, to medical report, uh, and they're they're following these studies as gospel truth. When you sit down and read them carefully, all these reports end with one particular thing, and this is the, what I found to be true when I did the consulting work for NASA to look at the review research grants by from different universities, from different study groups, wanting uh, uh, grant money from uh, NASA. And that is, they will all give you very rosy reports, and at the end of the report, it comes up with this. In order for our report, our study to be to be successful, in order of this, it's one thing that's definite for sure. We need more money for research. In other words, all these reports, all these studies that you read in the papers, they're one thing. They're an ad by the research institutes, by the scientists, for more money. So they will never give you a definitive answer. Because if they ever give you the definitive answer, they say, oh, that's it, our research over, <laughs> goodbye, thank you very much, we're going to go on to another job now, uh, well, that's it, they wouldn't have their jobs anymore. In order for a researcher to continue on their jobs, they have to have these crises come up again and again and again. Notice this, how many crises after, after, uh, began after 1990, I went back and looked at this. A large chunk of our medical crises, a large chunk of our, our medical incidents, where we need to have these studies go on and on and on and on began after 1990. 1990, 
there wasn't much complaining from the scientist community. You don't see that many reports. After 1990, tons of reports of everything for you in the universe is bad. Right? This has lead in it. This is this. This is this has, you know, uh, something bad for you. This has another thing that's bad for you. That has another. Wine has something good for you. Wine, you know, and all reports talk about, oh, it seems like this. It seems like that. Report suggests me. Report suggests this. Researchers say, suggest that. What's going on? Well, the Cold War ended. All the money that was spent by the Cold War uh, for the Department of Events into all these different research groups is gone. They need a new crisis to keep these labs going. So what happens? All the crises are created. And what happens? The public money keeps flowing into these labs, keeps these scientists employed, and this is where you have a large chunk of your research going on. And that's it. This is, one, marketing, in terms of the research labs. Two, there are groups out there who want to see Chemical Man come back. Chemical Man, does not mistaken, is not mistaken here, was done by the Nazis. Chemical Man, the genetic studies, originates with the Nazis. So genetics, in many cases, is a Nazi science. And this is where you have to be careful, because... There are good points to it, but there is also a lot of very bad points. And just because you think you're doing something good now for genetics doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be turned around and said, well, because you're genetically defective, sorry, you have to be euthanized for the good of the public. And that's exactly what happened in, 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 with the Nazis. That's exactly what happened in, with, with Germany's Hitler. And it wasn't just Hitler. It was all of not only, it was not only all of Germany. There were a lot of people, including the United States and Canada, including Jews, who supported the Nazi ideal that man was chemically based. That who you bred, the breeding, genetic breeding, made a difference. And you'll have d dictionaries. Whole, I have a whole dictionary here, and I have another old dictionary here, and I will be doing a, a, a thing on this. And they have, this is an old dictionary, this is prior to the 1960s. And the cool thing about these dictionaries prior to the 1960s, prior to the 1960s, is that a lot of the old terms, the old science terms, uh, the, what are now called racist, are still in them. And you will find a lot of the genetic arguments for these racist positions in them. And what's happening now with genetics is, once again, this genetics that was based in here, that's found in here, these old dictionaries, that was the basis for racism, is now coming back again. And that's in the genetics of happiness, happiness, the genetics of, uh, of depression, the gay gene. This is the, the old racism, the old scientific racism coming back again. It is a rehash of this stuff. So I advise you to take this stuff very carefully and, you know, research it. And this is one place you can come. You do not have to agree with me. I encourage you to go out and do more research. I will be providing more resources to come out to research, to, to check out. You don't have to, it's not with me. It's going to be with the journal Science. It's going to be with, with the, uh, uh, the journal Nature. There are public uh, publishing of these journal uh, 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 articles. I will show you the different places you can find them. And you can do your own research if that's what you want to do. But it is research. If you're going to go into gen genetics, you have to have an understanding of organic chemistry, and you have to have an understanding of quantum, phys quantum physics. That's the basics. If you do not have an understanding of quantum physics and, and organic chemistry, then you will not understand fully what the impact on the ge of the gen genetic study is. Anyways, I'm going to leave it here. That's about it for uh, this uh, uh, Insta vlog. Uh, I will come back hopefully uh, sometime this week and do some more. Professor. And professor of what? Professor of physics. 
Democratic Earth. Earth.